Paulie, what's up, man? See, Paulie, we've been actually trying to get you on this podcast for a long time because, number one, we're fans, but you're a big part of our, at least me personally, a big part of my growing up. You know, I you know, I was an MTV guy. Then your movies were some of the first comedies I saw in 92, 93, 94. So it was, I was, I'm just a huge fan. And uh, then obviously you used a stand-up comic. I just want to know, first off, like, how are you doing? How are you, how's COVID going for you? Uh, you know, obviously you can't really tour as a comedian. You could do dates here and there, but what have you been up to recently? Well, I definitely don't want to get COVID. Knock on wood, I haven't gotten it. You know what I mean? Because they say, you know, they say the people that get it, you know, the people that get it, that immune systems are, are fine. They're okay. But the people that's immune systems are fucked up. I could swear, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> swear I swear could, away, sir. Yeah. Their, their immune systems are fucked up. Then, you know, they can really be affected. And you, you can tell by my appearance, like, I, I can die without any COVID. Look at my immune system, bro. I look fucking thrash, bro. Not cool, not cool, dude. You want a banana, bro? No, um, no, uh, I don't know. I, I, you know, I'm a comic. You know what I mean. So all I do is think about jokes. So all I do is write jokes about it, and I try not to take the whole thing too serious because I think that you know we're all everyone's dying of different things, and this is obviously in the forefront of. You know, I'd like them to report how many people are dying of like, you know, cancer every day or, you know, or, or you know, drinking and driving or, you know, it's just, it's so, it's just weird. It's fucking weird. But I think the thing that's really fucked up about it is how they're closing the world down. And I think that's terrible. I think everyone should be able to, you know, live their life and just do, wear masks and stay away from people, but still like go out and do shit. I think it's terrible what's going on. You know, I think I just came from Florida and they don't, they don't even know what Panda is. They think Panda, 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 pan, pandemic is Panda Express. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, what the fuck is the pandemic dog? I know Panda Express. <laughs> As I say, Florida is just open, wild. They don't care down there. Well, you know, they, yeah, but people are surviving, dude. People are living fine. It's just, you know, it's it's yeah. disgusting. The whole thing's fucking disgusting, and uh, enough is enough, you know. But what are you going to do, you know? Well, obviously, for you, you know, and the the comedy store being in the family business. I mean, that probably has been a big source of pain, just being shut down, not being able to open it. Do you think that the Comedy Store will survive all of this? Uh, the Comedy Store will live live past all of us. So when and the whole world blows up, the Comedy Store will still be standing. <laughs> the Comedy Store is bigger than... Well, the Comedy Store is bigger than everyone. I mean, it's... Uh, it's a landmark. I mean, you get used to be zeros back in the day, you know, before that. And, and, you know, it's, um, you know, I, I think it's similar to like, you know, the, the, the Capitol building or, or the Chinese wax museum. I think that, you know, it'll always be there. So. Have you, uh, you know, you actually, you obviously had some famous babysitters growing up. Who was your favorite? Hmm. I'd have to say Chris Jackson. He wasn't that famous, but he played Winnie the Pooh at Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> Better than Sam Kinison and all those people? He was just good? Yeah, Sam. He's tired. We, we already talked about Sam. I had a lot of others. I had a <clears> – <throat> the guy's name was Chris Jackson. He was a comedian, a black guy, and, uh, and he was best friends with Eddie Murphy. He was part of Eddie Murphy's posse when Eddie would roll into the comedy store – back in the day with his, um, you know, with Fruity and Uncle Ray. And it was kind of like kind of the, the black version of like, you know, the Saudi Arabian princes showing up, you know, they were just rolling like, you know, eight Rolls Royces deep. And Chris Jackson was there and he was one of Eddie's writers and kind of friends. And, and on the side, he was Winnie the Pooh at Disneyland. That was like his side hustle. So he used to take me, um, he used to take me to uh to 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 Disneyland with uh with him and he'd say like all right I'm going to go be Winnie the Pooh you know don't get in trouble and then uh me and my friends Sean Kehoe uh whose best friend or whose dad was Billy Kehoe who was best friends with OJ Simpson um he uh he me and Sean used to used to kind of like uh uh we would shoplift at Disneyland <laughs> And, and we got in trouble. We got thrown in the Disneyland jail. And they said, they said, to, who took you here? I said, Winnie the Pooh. And they said, oh, fuck. Not only these guys 
shoplifters are also fucked up these kids, you know? <laughs> and then I stuck I was stuck in Disneyland jail with Sean. And then and then uh uh OJ Simpson came to pick up Sean and he started laughing at me. And I said, dude, don't laugh so much. Like pretty soon you'll be here. <laughs> I'm giving you guys some good jokes, man. I don't know why. <laughs> the whole time I'm sitting here, I'm like, is this real? Did he go to Disneyland Hotel? Is there even a Disneyland Hotel? Like, oh, No, man. Disneyland Jail. Dude, jail. Jail. Yeah, that's great. I love I'm it. One, I'm a really good comic. I know how to like move shit around and, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you had honestly though you had one of the most interesting childhoods like mm. it really you know you went to beverly hills high school mm. who else who did you go to school with back then beverly hills high school was like a scene out of a john hughes film you know um back in the 80s i mean the 80s to me was like the best decade in the world it was just so much fun you had less than zero you had you know pretty in pink and you had a. Uh, uh, you know, all those, all those Molly Ringwald films who I was obsessed with, by the way. And, um, and Beverly Hills High School was, you know, you had Lenny Kravitz there. He was older than me. You had Nicolas Cage. He was there. You got Angelina Jolie was there. David Schwimmer was there. And it was just like, it was almost like a mini college because you had four schools in Beverly Hills. You had El Rodale, you had Hawthorne, you had Beverly Vista and Horace Mann. Those were the four junior highs. And all the kids that graduated from seventh and eighth grade at those schools, they merged to Beverly Hills High School. So it was like a mini college. And it was pretty awesome. Like all the girls, they wore Sassoon jeans. You know what I mean? Ooh, la, la, Sassoon with the feathered hair. And um, we had Oingo Boingo play at our swim gym in ninth grade. Um, so. But this, so when you look around and you see a Nicolas Cage or an Angelina Jolie, could you tell that they had potential to be huge stars? Well, Nicolas Cage was older than me, so I wasn't in school when he was there. And Angelina Jolie was younger than me, so I wasn't there when she was there either. She was there after me, and Nick was there before me. But um, David Schwimmer was around. Um, David Schwimmer used to have a fucked up nose. Really? Yeah, he had a he had a he had a uh, a, a nose big job. nose, like a Jewish nose, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and then he got uh he got uh I think a nose job when he was in school. Oh, it changed while he was actually in school. He didn't did you know that were... David Schwimmer got a nose job when he was younger? I did not. I didn't Dax, know that. Do you know that? I didn't know that. But did everyone in school know? Like, did they, I'm sure they knew you. You were a popular kid, but did they know like who your family was that they owned the comedy store. It didn't seem that weird at the time because, you know, you're going to school with a lot of celebrities' kids. Um, so, you know, the older I've gotten, the more I realize, like, that life that, you know, that I had was very odd. Um, but when you're in the middle of it, you know, if you're hanging out with Smokey Robinson's kid, Barry Robinson, it was very normal. It wasn't. It wasn't like... Oh my God, that's weird, you know, or going over to Diana Ross's, um, you know, cousin or Diana Ross's house because Tommy Gardner was, was her um, nephew, you know, hold on one sec. I got a little rice cooking one sec. Okay. <laughs> hold on. Hold, I got to turn off my rice. I, I like rice. sticky rice, bro. Sticky rice, dude. Hold on one sec. Sticky rice is best. Sorry. No, no you're worries. good. Rice comes how, first. Yeah. How was, uh, when you went to the parking lot at, at Beverly Hills High School, did all the kids have flashy cars or was it a yes. car show? Yes. Yes. Yeah, they all had Beamers. What did you drive when you were young? Um, I, drove a, I drove a Beamer. I was, <laughs> it was just the thing to do? It was 2000, it was the, uh, it was the 1973 mile. 1973 model and it was uh a 2002 with the circle taillights and i painted it lime green and i put a license plate on it that said paul bro on it it was like a custom license plate and then in 12th grade i got a cj7 jeep um and i painted it purple and it was a convertible jeep and i took my license plate from the from the lime green bmw and i put it on my purple jeep 
And that's when I started acting. And I had my headshots from my commercial agent from the Beverly Hecht agency. And I, um, I, would, I would drive down Sunset and my hair was wild. I'm like, yo, bro, check out my headshot, bro. I'm an actor, dude. Check it out, bro. And I'd fucking <laughs> hand out my headshots to just random people. <laughs> it was so much fun, dude. But when you- it was literally like a fucking, you know, Sunset Strip was like, it was like just, it just represented smiles and happiness and good times. And now it represents fucking horror. You know, I hate driving down Sunset Boulevard now, it's so sad. You know, it's so sad to me. There's no soul there. You know, there's this no... This is like, like just before COVID you're talking about, there was still no soul. Like exactly. when things were somewhat normal. Absolutely. You know, yeah. since the internet since the internet and this whole kind of digital world just fucked it all up, you know? It's, I mean, yeah, I, I work I mean, what's so weird, what's so weird to me is like, I'll listen to Hair Nation on like on serious i'm like these fucking songs are all hit songs it could be cinderella it could be fucking it could be um you know skid row and what's so weird to me is why the fuck hasn't the heavy metal scene been like kind of rebooted by the younger generation you know what i mean like why don't why is it all dj shit like that like why why isn't there heavy metal bands from like the young kids you know what i mean but if they yeah. are, they're they're just on TikTok. They're not going and touring, you know, the Viper Room and stuff like that. They're just hanging out on TikTok and making a bunch of money without having but, to go. But anywhere. I don't think is there even a heavy is there is there even a heavy metal younger scene like with kids with the long hair and like looking like chicks and shit. You know, when they do it though, it seems like it's forced and it right. comes off corny now. Like when the kids do it, like, oh, you're just trying too hard. In yeah. some in some ways, and it's just, uh, and we see that too. You know, obviously, me and Dax started at TMZ. You know, we kind of, you know, there was nightlife. You know, that's when like guys were running out with cameras. But now there's not, there's no nightlife. At least in LA and in, in New York, there's no nightlife. Yeah. Um, now they just do house parties. They do these, you know, they rent a house and they just do these house parties. So no one really has to party on Sunset Boulevard. And they try to show off their houses now that they rent their Airbnbs. Yeah. So it's uh, I'd be scared to have an Airbnb, like to have like a really nice house and put out for Airbnbs in L.A., especially with 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 what everyone does with these houses that you see on yeah. YouTube. I'd be, it'd be nuts. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's just, you know, it's the world has shifted, you know, in some weird, you know, place right now. And we're all doing our fucking interviews in this way as opposed to being in person. And this is the new norm. You know, the new norm is just talking to Zoom. I mean, seven, eight months ago, people didn't even know what fucking Zoom was, you know? Yeah. And now you it's did, just like, you know. Yeah, yeah. When you first started doing stand-up comedy, your first show, you did it in Culver City, not at the comedy store. Is that correct? Yes. Why did you not do it at the comedy store? Did you just feel like you had to get in there and, like, work it out before you could go to the comedy store because it is the mecca? Well, yeah, for obvious reasons. I mean, it's like when Mitzi Shore's son – has decided to do stand up. I mean, it's 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 kind of like, oh, great. You know what I mean? So, you know, m- my main thing was to get good before I showcase for her, you know, um, and, and to try to, you know, create something, you know, individually. And thank God, knock on wood, wherever that is, thank God that I hit and I made it and I did all my movies and MTV. And people don't, you know, America doesn't know me as Mitzi Shore's kid. They know me as, you know, the guy from Son-in-Law and MTV and, and Biodome and all my films and all my stand-up stuff. So I was able to break through, you know. So my plan, I guess, worked, you know. What What do you consider your first big break? MTV, for sure. MTV? MTV was fucking amazing, dude. It was heaven. It was like, it was like getting a ticket to, you know, the ball, you know, like the coolest party or whatever. I mean... As a VJ, when I would hold an MTV microphone, you know, that had a cube on it that said MTV, immediately you were knighted as like the coolest person in the world. And it just felt cool to, you know, to, you know, interview bands that I worshipped growing up and, and, you know, travel America and the world with it. And uh, I was very fortunate. And the older I've gotten, the more I realized how much that time how important it was to not just me, but to, uh, you know, to, uh, um, to just this generation, you know, your generation. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, you were a big part of our growing up. You know, it's uh, it's very cool. I, I think I hope people respect, you know, what you did. I mean, even the character, the weasel was everyone was doing the weasel. I still do the weasel. How did that character come about? Was that who Paulie Shore was or did you kind of create that? It was kind of an accident in a way. Um, I mean, that was kind of how I talked and walked and dressed. But then, like, once I got on MTV, I started pausing between my words. And I don't know if it's because I was nervous. I don't know if it's because I was fucking around. I don't know if it was because, you know, different people called me a weasel. It wasn't like Pee Wee Herman where... You know, like, oh, I'm going to sit in a room and I'm going to come up with this thing. And, you know, it developed. It just kind of developed. And it was almost I, I kind of I mirror it with that old Reese's peanut butter commercial, which was, you know, like um, where you have a peanut butter and then you have the chocolate and you mix it up and you're like, oh, shit, like this is awesome. So it was just kind of like a, a happy accident, I think. Yeah, I say because that character i think kind of like really started off everyone else mimicking and feeling that they needed a character when they're on like mtv or you know we've talked to mike the situation who is like i had to develop a character to be on a reality show and i think what's up with my stupid scarf dude this is like retarded <laughs> i just came from the gym sorry <laughs> It looks very nice. <laughs> I look like a Talibani that's like from West Hollywood or something. <laughs> you ready to read our fortunes, it looks like. Exactly. <laughs> uh, no, I, I was just asking about the the character thing. You know, I, I, I think that that has played such a big role in other people being successful. And I, I feel like you're one of those pioneer people that that character is really what kind of like launched your career and do you, did you ever feel like you got sick of it though like you didn't want to be the weasel yeah absolutely you know i mean the harder you rise the harder you fall you know um and when i fell i took it very personal and i got very sad and um because i wanted to work you know i just liked showing up on movie sets and just fucking having fun and and fucking with people on the set and 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 you know so you, you know, I you did fell, it, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't. I don't feel like, feel like I saw, I saw you, fall. you fall. Maybe you felt like that, but why? Why do you say that? Well, because the box office, the box office really kind of dictates, you know, if they're going to do another movie, you know. And and my first movies all performed, and then Biodome was the last one that I did, and that didn't perform at all. It did okay. I mean, you know, hindsight, you know, what twenty years later, twenty five years later. It's one of the biggest, you know, kind of cult classic comedies of this generation. I guess it is that that's how I feel when I'm out and people say they saw it. But it's really about the box office. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter what you do. If your box office is not, you know, it's it's just a numbers game. It's like, and, and I didn't think, I wasn't, I didn't pat myself on the back. I wasn't like, oh, that was awesome. Like you did a great that was a great run. Like take some time off and switch it up. I was just, that's what I did. Polly Shore is dead. I don't know if you guys saw that. Yeah. It yeah. was great. Yeah. So, so when I say fell off, um, I mean, just from the studio world, you know, as far as, you know, st you know, studios, I mean, the Lionsgate film that just came out, the guest house, that was my first studio film I did in a long time. And it felt like a real studio film, you know, in the press, in the, um, in the response and the marketing. Um, so, so that yeah, was cool. You know, it, it bothers me a little bit when you, people even say that you fell off. I'm like, what are you talking about? Because in my mind, it's like you accomplished it. You accomplished it. You did everything you got. You did stand up. You got on TV. You were successful. You made movies. You made great movies that people loved. You're a big part of people's, uh, you know, growing up. And then, I mean, what else is there to do? You're financially, you did well, like the, uh, you know, there's, in my opinion, you made it, you know, like this is the goal. Cool. You're able to kind of live. You have total freedom. Um, why do you, you know, obviously Encino Man, classic, Son-in-Law, great movie. In the Army Now, great movie. Do you think the critics just kind of ganged up on you at all? Yeah, of course. You know, it was, um, you know, they do that all the time. You know, um, they, uh, you know, if it, if it's not, you know, 
thought provoking comedy and if it's not uh you know something that is really heady you know like then immediately like oh this is dumb as opposed to like no it's not really dumb it's actually makes me feel good watching this and you know you're dumb uh you know for for you know telling me what to think about what this is so it was you know it's uh, i don't know i mean it's it's i mean look at fucking like uh i don't know i mean it's the business we're in you know i, I don't know i don't know what to say no, the main I, I, thing I, you know the I, main I, thing I, is yeah sorry. sorry no 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 go ahead finish your story. no i was just saying i feel that you know, that, um, that I've been put through, like, it's almost like a gang member trying to join a gang and they get initiated and they get the shit beat out of them for so long. And then they finally survive and they become a man and they become like a gang member, like, yeah, man. And I feel like that now, like, I feel like that no matter what I do, as far as my, my projects, in, in my comedy and my, whether it's a movie or this, I'm not affected. I'm not affected as much as I was when I was younger. When you're younger, you're a lot more insecure and you're a lot more fearful and you're a lot more kind of like, you know, trying to please. And now I'm, I'm just happy to get through another day. You know, I'm just happy. Like, you know, that whatever I did, like you guys said, has stuck. You know, everywhere I go, knock on wood. I, yeah, I keep knocking on wood because it can always change. You never fucking know. But everywhere I go, there's, like, love for me. You know, and, and we're talking, like, every race, every age, people give me hugs, you know. And, and it's, it's hard for me. It's kind of like why I'm not in a relationship, you know. It's, it's hard for me to let love in. You know, it's really hard for me to be, like, <sighs> You know, really, you know, when someone comes up to me and says, da, 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 or a girl says, I really love you. It's like, you know, and I think a lot of it has to do with my upbringing, you know, because my mom, my mom never said she really loved me, even though I know she did. She didn't say it, but she also said that she programmed me to be a comedian and that you can't say, you can't say comedians want to be wanted. Do you understand? That's why we, that's a lot of reason why I get up on that stage. When I get up on that stage, I'm more comfortable there than anywhere in my life. I just feel like, you know, I feel like this love and that's like the, you know, and that's how I get it. Um, but um, yeah, it's very hard for me to accept pats on the back. You know, it just is. I don't know. Yeah. That that makes me sad for you, man, that your mom was didn't say that. Like that genuinely makes me sad that you didn't get to hear that growing up because I, I like Adam and I we look at you and you know, you really are our childhood. It's 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 crazy and you know, I I hope that you do love that let that love in at some point because there are a lot of people who love you out there. And mm. the one thing I think if social media was around when Biodome was out, mm. there there would have been no studio that could have said that wasn't a success. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like, I, I think that there would have been a lot of love shown to the studios and like, hey, this there should be a second or there should be a third. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think social media has changed that and given power to the public, not just critics, not just the studio execs. Like, there's people now who can voice their opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I took the power I, from them, yeah. Yeah, no, I get it. No, I get it. I think that I think it's cool, but it is what it is. You know, today, as of today, you know, February 4th or whatever, I just turned 51 like three days ago, or excuse me, 53, three days ago. And I'm really happy. You know, I live in uh, Las Vegas now and I have a really nice house out here and I got a great little crew out here and I'm, 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 I like teaching kids, you know, I like teaching um, younger comics how to produce and and, and support them and that I get off on helping people. Um, and there's a good, great arts community out here in Vegas. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the arts district in Las Vegas, but it's dope. It's like Silver Lake or Williamsburg. There's murals everywhere. There's all young kids. It's like, it's the area between the strip and Fremont street. There's this whole like space that's just 
dedicated to artists. And I just think this this area, this downtown area in Vegas is uh, is good. And it's kind of where I'm at right now. And, you know, I don't know if I'll, I'll come back to L.A. anytime soon. Um, but we'll see, you know, we'll see. So, you know, um, yeah, yeah. Like many people in the world, you know, there there are setbacks in their career, you know, but in the entertainment business, uh, their setbacks become so public. And mm. what is your advice to someone who's dealing with the public setback? Because, you know, you had to deal with people saying some negative things about you or about your work. And I can, you know, you work so hard at it. And mm. then all of a sudden people, you know, an accountant doesn't get critiqued in the public, but said, you know, you're in the public eye, people start to look down. What's your advice to someone kind of dealing with like the public setback or public i don't want to say failure because you didn't have any failure it's just just setback a little bit um i'd have to say that you know you you choose you know it's kind of like um you know you choose to be in front of the camera and when you choose to be in front of the camera people are going to react to you period whether you like it or not so be ready for both, you know, because you're putting yourself out there. It's kind of like a girl getting a fake boobs. You know, she puts herself out for guys to be like, whoa, what's up? Because there's boobs or, or people with tattoos on their faces, all over their face. You know, you, know, you put yourself out there to, to, to be, you know, I don't want to say interrogated, but to be, you know, looked upon, oh, hey, look at his tattoos. It's like, dude, I got it. I got fucking tattoos. What do you want from me? Like, you know, well, dude, don't get mad at me. You put yourself on TV. You know, you put yourself out there. You know, we want us all to kiss your ass. You know what I mean? It's like you put yourself out there. Be ready to get, get lashed. So my suggestion and my advice is to just not try to take it personal. You know, don't take it personal like I did. And that's where I, 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 I took it personal. You know, I, 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 I didn't look at what I had. I look at what I didn't have. And now I, I look at what I have and I don't look at what I don't have. And that's just called maturity. And that's called growth. And that's called just experience and time. You know, you want to really be able to pat yourself on, on your back. And now I'm at a place now where I have, you know, I really... I really realized like what the fuck I did. And it's like, holy shit, I did some awesome stuff. You know, my last movie did really well. And the stuff I'm doing on YouTube is fucking, I think, killer. You know, these scene, I do these uh, classic scenes from classic movies. I don't know if you guys saw those. Yeah. But, you know, I just love it. You know, I love th this format. I love like, you know, I can come up with something and just put it out there. Yep. And, you know, and that's it. And it's, it's pretty cool. You know, I don't need millions of people to watch my shit, you know, because I'm getting it here. You know, and I always tell people, I had this 26-year-old kid come up to me the other day. I was at a coffee shop here in Vegas, and he was, he was like, freaking out. He's like, oh, my God. He's like, he wanted to film me. I'm like, dude, I don't want to be filmed. What do you want? Like, tell me what you want, and I'll, I'll answer for you. And he says, what do I do? You know, I really want to know, what do I do? And I said, find something that makes you happy because every day you're going to have to get out of bed and be motivated by that. So for me, I was fortunate to find that I love making people happy and stand up comedy at an early age, besides the fact that, you know, I'm pretty good at it and I work hard at it and, you know, I have some sort of a talent, but I really enjoy making people happy because when I make people happy, I make me happy. So it's like a, it's a, it's a uh, constant thing. So. You know, I just did a whole tour of Florida this last week. Every show was sold out <coughs> everywhere. No social distancing. People are sitting on each other's fucking laps. And I had a fucking great time. And it was like, it was fucking awesome. It was like, I gave love. They gave me love. And it was like this. And especially now that, you know, they took this shit away from all us comics, you know, these these shows and the stages you get on that stage now there's a different feeling you just like feel it more it's like you know because you know we we excuse me i got a burp one sec we take comedy in the stage for granted and not anymore i'll tell you that not anymore you know yeah what uh 
you know, recently, obviously this past week, Dustin Diamond passed away. And I, I think people forget, you know, obviously Saved by the Bell was a huge show, but he had it difficult for many years in his life, you know, obviously from people coming up to him on the street, yelling screech at him, uh, you know, obviously trying to get away from that role being screech. It's, it's not easy. You know, I think he was kind of like a punching bag for some people, but he didn't have it easy, especially from the cast members. Do you sympathize with him, you know, being famous young? Like, do you feel like people don't see the other side of it? Like just being the public guy, especially being the center character when he's like, he's really Dustin Diamond, not Screech. It's like what I said earlier. You put yourself on TV, you're asking for it. Period. Positive or negative. You know, you're, you, you put a tattoo on your face, all over your face. You know, you're asking for it, you know, so... You know, you gotta. It's it's. You make your bed. You know, you gotta lie. Is it lie in it? What the fuck's it saying? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. If you make it, you make it. What is it? Make your bed. You lie in it. Something like that. Yeah. He decided. <laughs> he was. He was old enough. He got the opportunity. He made a lot of money. He played a goofy character on TV. You know, and for for yeah, whatever but- reason, he wasn't he wasn't able to shift out of it and do something else like a Robin Williams or some of these other guys. You know. Dustin Diamond's a talented kid. It's not like he, he wasn't talented. He was, it's not like he wasn't a good actor. And, and I'm sure, you know, he got cast in roles. It's the old saying, you know, you work so hard, you know, in the business to, uh, to come up with your own thing. And then you work so hard in the business to get away from your own thing. And it's kind of like a double, double edged sword. It's like, you know, it's, uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I, I also feel that once you are in the crosshairs of the press, sometimes they only look for the bad. Like they're not out there looking like, let's they're say like a Britney news. Spears. Yeah. Britney Spears. Perfect example. No one's ever talking about the good that she does or if she donated a million dollars to charity, no one's going to talk about, it. they're going to talk about the shit video she posted on Instagram where she looks terrible, you know? And I think, Dustin it was kind of in that same realm where it didn't matter what he did. He just constantly got shit on in the press, you know, and, you know, and it actually reminds me when you, when you did your like show on, it was Fox, right? Did you, did you feel that they just targeted you and like, it could have been a really good show if they would have just let give you it a and shot, given it a shot. The show, you know, like, you don't go into anything in this business going, oh, this is going to be a piece of shit. You know, you go into it like, hey, I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to give it my heart and I'm going to work as a team and we're going to make this work. But I think the issue with the show was just the concept. And I never really liked the concept, but I, but I, uh, I, I um, told myself that, hey, we'll make this concept work. So to me, the idea of me playing a spoiled rich kid living in Brentwood with his dad as he's having sex with his gold digging girlfriend and we're at each other's throats isn't really the right concept for me as a sitcom. And that's really what it boils down to. You know, the idea, I think if it was the more right idea, like a son-in-law or something like that in that kind of realm and feel where I'm fish out, where I'm fish out of water, like in the army now or in the biodome or Polly with his family that had, that they had to adopt me. You know what I mean? I think it would have been a hit show. It was just the concept. And again, that's my fault because I decided to, I, I told myself like, Hey, we're going to make this fucking work. And it just didn't work because the premise was wrong. So you can, you can get as many writers to fuck with shit. <clears throat> you can get as many good actors to act in it. But if, the, if it's not on the page, it's not on the stage. And if the concept isn't the right concept, then it's not going to work. That's why Guest House worked. It's Polly Shore living in a fucking guest house, and he won't leave. <laughs> yeah. It's great. I mean, yeah. Just, just that one se- That's all you need to explain it. One sentence, and it's great. Yeah. What, if so that's just, really it. I don't blame. I don't blame anyone except for myself. You know, I should have said no to the yeah. to the offer. It's just an offer. 
you know, your agents call you up. Hey, do you want to do this TV show? I'm like, well, what's the idea? Da, 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 da. And I'm like, oh, that sounds good. I'm fucking an idiot. I didn't think. Yeah, but again, this... I go back to, so, but the, we've seen a thousand actors do pilots or shows and, you know, it, this is the TV industry. Shit doesn't always pan out. So, you know, then I think, you know, why didn't you come back with a different show? Because I feel like you are crazy talented. There should have just been a different sitcom. You know, like this one didn't work out. Let's let's try a different version of it. Well, I had yeah. fired my agent and my managers after the whole debacle. And I just kind of wanted to be alone. Mm. So, was, you know, you I just decided I you just, just wanted to do your own thing. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of like um, be alone. And then there was a time where I was trying to get other represent representatives and I got passed on by a lot of people, you know, the right, you know, the Brillsteins and whoever, like the bigger managers were. And, um, and I just hit the road. You know what I mean? I grew up, I really grew up, you know, it was a good thing. I, I kind of almost did it on purpose. I almost sabotaged my career a little bit on purpose so I can be spit out and I can be, and I can connect with people because my whole life, I'd been, you know, MTV into the movies and to, with my mom and the store. And I'd never been connected to America. And now for 30 years, I've been touring all over America. I feel more connected in America than I do in Hollywood, to be honest. You know, I feel like I'm more everyday man. And I think I'm just better now because of that. Um, so in hindsight, it was actually a good thing. Because it made me grow up and may become a way better comic and a way better actor. And I was able to write and produce and star in Polly Shore's Dead, which to me was the best thing I've ever done because it's so fucking honest and it's fucking hilarious, dude. I mean, it is one of the, it's so dark, but so funny. In that particular film, it was the beginning of the second part of my career where I was like, you know what? I want to make sure my fans really love this. So I got the Bucky character in there, the Bucky from Kentucky. But I want to make people, I want to make sure the people that don't like me love this as well. And it accomplished that. We got into Sundance and, and we did really well with it because it was just honest and dark and real. And, and, um, and I, I look at it now, I'm like, how the fuck did I pull that off? I mean, I have over 50 like major stars in that movie. Is that the cool part though? Because like it's like the second part of your career is if uh, eventually when the critics started to actually exactly. say, you know what, Paulie's actually really funny. He's great because the first movies, which are it's insane, son of a lot the people they bashed that shit. They said they didn't like it, but all of a sudden he started doing you know Paulie Shore stands alone and and all these other movies, and then the critics turned and like you know what, this is actually good. You started to get good reviews then. Yes, yes, because I dropped the shtick. And I was more real and I kind of did, I did what I wanted to do, which was keep my fans, you know, because I was still being me and then gain people that didn't like my original shit. And now that I'm older, <laughs> the people that didn't like my original shit actually fucking love my original shit. You know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, like I watched, I watched Biodome like uh, when I was in Maui on fucking quarantine. I'm like, this is fucking funny, dude. Like, this is really funny. And, you know, I, again, I said to you guys like 15 minutes ago, I said I really pat myself on the back on those films because I love those films now, you know? Like, but you guys even asked the question, like, and it's true. You know, after my stuff kind of started to, you know, shift out, after that started to happen, um, you know, I was kind of sick of the wheeze and I was sick of my movies and I was sick of the whole thing. You know what I mean? And now that I'm older, I'm like, fuck, that shit was awesome. So it's kind of, it's kind of like, a, you know what I mean? It's like this. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, was that the first time you've watched Biodome in a long time? Yes. Like ever or just in a long time? Probably in a long time. I've always wondered if... if you know, actors or actresses will go back and see their old movies and just kind of like reevaluate. Is it hard to watch a movie and just enjoy it though? Do you evaluate yourself throughout the whole thing? Like, Oh, that joke could have been funnier. Oh, I landed that joke so hard. Or 
any of that? Uh, well, I have to say it, it depends on where I'm at in my life. So when I watched Biodome three months ago, I was at the place that I'm at right now. Free. I'm free. You know what I mean? I feel free. So I was able to open my heart and just kind of watch it as kind of like a, just a normal person watching a film. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I viewed it. And it was funny. I looked at it. I didn't look at it as I was in it. I just looked at it as a film, you know? So, yeah. Now the horny 14 year olds come out of me. I want to know what was the Playboy Mansion really like? I mean, you went down, you went there a lot. Let me get some rice. One sec. Let me get some rice. One sec. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Should I just redo that question? (laughs) Ask him again. Yeah. Sorry about that. You're good. So, yeah. So, how was. I think we always wanted to know what was the Playboy Mansion really like. You went there a lot. Was it that good? Was it were the parties great? What was the vibe like? It was just terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I hated going. Have you ever been to the dentist and get a root canal? <laughs> I haven't. Same seen exact with- thing with less clothes. No. How, it's what? not just the Playboy Mansion. It was the world. This was before the internet. This was before. So, you know, you can say, hey, Paris, France. What was Paris, France like? Like, it was fucking dope. You know, what was, <laughs> you know, what was New York City like? You know, it's fucking awesome. You know, what was the Playboy Mansion? It was awesome. It was the world. It was, you know, there was no, you know, there was no like real cameras back then, you know, unless the Kodak camera. And you couldn't really bring it in, so. So so, what but, was that but, one? What was the one thing that you remember? You the craziest thing you saw go down in there, that just is in people's minds because there was no cameras or TMZ or anything to document that moment. What was the craziest moment? Well, I don't know. Just you know, witnessing Hugh Hefner with all the girls around him, just all the time, just in awe. Just be like, this guy's the man. You know, he created this awesome magazine and all these girls want to hang out with him and be in the magazine. You know, just seeing that kind of spectacle all the time whenever I went up there. I never went up to him and shook his hand, even though he was the one that invited me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I had a funny story. Uh, it was pretty funny. So he used to do the Sunday fun day thing, you know? Yeah, which was uh, which was the um, which was the uh, um, I think it was like I don't know, it was like Sundays at the pool type thing, you know. It's like not a lot of people, and he'd always have like a lunch thing, and uh, and there was always tons of food left over. And I always every Sunday I wouldn't go visit my mom. I would always visit my mom on Sundays, and I would always bring her food. I would stop by like Greenblatt's or. Nate Nows or or Jerry's Deli, and I'd always bring my mom soup or pastrami sandwiches or whatever. It was just my thing. I always did that. So I was like, fuck, I'm just going to ask Hef if I can have some food left over. There's all this great food. I'm going to ask Hef, you know, hey, can I get a plate to go? I didn't want to, like, ask the staff. So I walked up to him, and he's sitting there with all his babes and, like, this guy Ron, Ron Smith and a couple of his friends. And I'm like, Hef, is it cool? Like, I'm going to go see my mom. Can I take a plate of food? I want to bring it to my mom, you know, maybe some asparagus and some beef and da da. And he looks at me with a straight face. He's like, "No." And I'm like, ha, 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 you're kidding, right? There's all this food I could take from my mom." He's like, "Ah, no, 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 no." I'm like, "Okay." And I like walked off. I felt like two inches tall. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> and then I think he, I think he banned me for a while after that. Really? I think I was some something where he's like, "We got to watch Polly Shore." You know? <laughs> Because I wanted to bring some deli home to my mom. I was like, well, it's probably all going to waste at the end of the day. I thought it was pretty funny, though. That's awesome. How funny. How did you get the invitations to go to the parties there? Like, how did that work? How did it go down? Well, um, the first time I got asked to go there was with the Barbie was with the Barbie twins. Yes, I remember them. Yeah, I remember, remember them. them? Yeah, oh, yeah, they asked me. That was my first time ever up there. And then... Um, and then after that, you kind of just got on his list. 
And it was almost like Willy Wonka, like he'd send you a ticket and you'd be like, holy shit, you know? <laughs> and then, but I was always pretty chill up there. I was never, but I was always, I was never like um, a guy that would, I did, I did do ecstasy, I think a couple times up there. But I was never exactly. going crazy, like going off the deep end, like, you know, swinging off of vines. And, you know, it was always like you were being watched. So there was tons of security around and tons of cameras. So it wasn't like you did have to be on your best behavior, you know. But I feel like that was the one place that you could get away with that kind of shit. Like, and they don't care. Yes and no. It's it's still someone's house and it's still like, you know, a private event. So. Interesting. What wow. uh, what was the wildest thing you ever saw on MTV Spring Break? Ooh, that's a great question. I feel like I'm giving you guys all my answers for my memoir and my documentary and all that stuff. So we got to wrap it up soon. <laughs> <laughs> you, you want you could just push rewind. Well, actually, here's the thing, Paul. I want to talk to you about your documentary. Well, I love we both love the Paul Shore stands alone. The documentary. Um, because it follows you on the road. Uh, I think it's in Wisconsin. Does you do you feel like it resonates with you a lot? Because you know, obviously, it shows you on the road. But then, like that relationship with your your family. You know, there is so much of the voicemails going back and forth. Like when you look back at it, is it like a really special project of yours? Because you could see that how tight that relationship is with your mom and just how much you cared. Because that's I think that shows a lot about you personally. That we got to see like that dynamic the relationship, how much you loved each other, and it's cool. It was interesting. Yeah, um, wait for Polly Shore Stands Alone, the six-part series that I haven't released yet. If I you really like don't. Polly Shore Stands Alone, the six-part series is a lot heavier, and it's a lot deeper. Um, what happened was, is um, my mom was dying of Parkinson's for a long time. And, you know, I was, the, I was, the, uh, I was her baby. I'm the baby of the family, so... I lived in LA and I was taking care of her the best that I could. And I was alone. You know, I didn't have, I, I didn't really have, well, I had a girlfriend that we would see each other and go through it. But personally, like my dad was in Vegas and my mom obviously was sick and me and my brothers weren't talking. So when you're alone and you're going through something, you have to express it to someone. So that's why I said, you know what? I got to film this part of my life. Because I'm in pain and I'm going through some a lot of stuff and and having a camera with me is going to make me feel better. And that was kind of what I wanted to um, I wanted to come across because it's very relatable because if you think about it, we're all somewhat in pain, different times, different levels. Everyone kind of goes out, you know, into life with a smile, you know, like. But underneath, you know, divorce or this or, you know, or, you know, abuse or, you know what I mean? And for me, I was going out on the road playing these markets in these smaller towns doing what I do. But underneath it, my mom was dying and it was fucking exhausting because I wear my heart on my sleeve and um, and I just felt you know, I needed to, to film it. And it was just me and a camera guy. It wasn't like a big crew. It was just me and a camera guy, this guy, Jake. And, um, and to me, Polly Shore Stands Alone, the series, is the best thing I've ever done in my career because it's the most vulnerable I've ever been. I think, like, Stands Alone is kind of like circling the cancer, but the six part series is like operating on it. Like it's me moving my mom. It's me constantly touring, you know, um, and, uh, you know, and the stuff with my siblings and, and different things like that. So it was like a, it was therapy for me. And, um, you know, uh, you know, I was, I was sad. I, I will not say I was sad, but I was burnt. You know, I was like really, you know, but that's why those fans, if you notice in that movie, they they were my medicine. You know, they were my medicine. People in America are my medicine. Like anytime anything's fucked up, if I go on tour, I'm like, I feel that that love and I feel, you know, that that uh that thing, you know. 
Yeah. You didn't like when the fans touched you. Like when I remember well, doing the photo, the meet and greets after, you were very persistent about like they had to come behind you and they could put their hand. Is that how you really well, were in the meet and greets? Yeah, because what happens is, you know, I don't want to say I'm a little guy, but I'm like five nine, five nine and a half. And these people from the Midwest, their arms are as big as my head. <laughs> <laughs> And I had, I had had back surgery, you know, years ago um, from just traveling and touring and shit. I had a, a L5S1. I had a pinch, pinch sciatic nerve. So if you push down on your spine and some arm around you, you're pushing down, you're going to fuck up your back more. So it's really about my safety, um, mm. you know, that. And that was really it because, you know, especially, you know, they all want to touch you. You know, they're drunk. You know, they want to like, oh, yo, bro, I'm like, oh, dude, whoa, ow, fuck, my back. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it was kind of like that. So that was really, that was really all it is. You know, other than that, you know, I'm cool with hugging people and talking to people. So, how's been, yeah. how's podcasting been for you? Cause you've got Polly Shore's Random Rants. Um, and it's obviously done well, uh, for podcasting. So, you know, is that cathartic for you to get out and talk and kind of, you know, if maybe you can't go to a venue all the time, because we don't always live in Florida, but you're able to be funny and you're able to like connect with an audience on that platform. Yeah, I think any platform works, you know, it could be a podcast, it could be this, this is nice talking to you guys. Um, it could be, you know, my classic scenes, it could be my karaoke band, it could be podcasting. It's all good. You know, everything is good. You know, this whole format is good. If you're, if you like to be out there, this is the format for you. So yeah, I like it. I like it all. It's, it's all positive. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Adam free. Oh, uh, Adam froze. I'm good. I'm okay. Back. You're back. Um, all right. Well, do you I have any last questions for him? One last question. Um, Obviously, you grew up in the comedy store. Who was the one comedian when you first saw – they weren't a star yet, but you knew they had it. They had that it factor. All of them. Every one of them that's famous, I knew. Yeah. Had that it – I mean, you look at fucking early tapes of Jim Carrey. You're like, this guy's fucking genius. You know, you look at Roseanne, early tapes of her. She's like amazing. I mean, you go down the list there, I, anyone that's a star, I knew, you know, I saw early on before they made it and I always knew that they would, um, that they would, uh, uh, you know, become successful. You know, it happens at different times for different people. Anyone that's watching this, that's in the business, you know, I try to tell people just to be patient, you know, um, you know, if you're talented and you're persistent and your, you know, your work ethic is, is, you know, 24 seven, you can break in on that one thing and all of a sudden you hit, you know? Um, so it's really about the work and putting in the time. That's really what it's about. I mean, look at Rodney Dangerfield. This guy didn't hit till his sixties, you know? Um, and he had a run, what a 20 year run, 15 year run or whatever it was. And then he, he passed in his, I think the early seventies or something, but you guys got to love what you do. I mean, I, I tell everyone that in life, you know, you just got to, you know, love what you do and you know, come from that place. And a lot of people, unfortunately, they haven't found out what they love. And that's sad. You know, that's sad to me when people are like, I don't know what I like. I don't know what I want to do. I'm like, that's sad. So, yeah. Well, listen, Paulie, I, uh, it, this is a really special podcast for us because, again, I would, you know, this is uh, you're a big part of my my comedy humor and what I'm attracted to as far as in the comedic world. I mean, Encino Man, Son of Law, in the Army now, I could keep naming your movies. They're just they're classics to me. And, a, and to a lot you of have to watch also. you have to watch Guest House. Have you seen Guest House yet? I saw Guest House. I saw it, it came out a couple months ago. That was a great one. I mean, I I could go on the Poly Stands alone, which is on Amazon Prime right now. Poly Shore is dead. It's also on Amazon Prime. Uh, you know, I recommend people keep up with you on Instagram because you're hysterical on there. And I'm very happy. You did something a couple months ago. Someone posted this vintage Polish shirt and brought it back on the website. 
It's just the old school Pauly shirt. Mm. Uh, so cool, man. I, I, a lot of comedians do merch, but mm. your merch is just better. Uh, and, mm. I, and I'm not kissing your ass, but I am kissing your ass. The merch is just cool. It's fun. That Pauly mm. shirt is just so rad and it's great. And it's, mm, thanks. it's great. So it's uh, I really, I recommend people listen to the podcast. Pauly Shore. Check out his website. Follow him on Instagram at Paulie Short. Paulie, thank you so much for your time, yeah. brother. It's a, and, and, an honor. Yeah, and lastly, you know, um, you know, uh, I want to thank you guys for, um, for, um, you know, uh, you know, appreciating all the shit that I did back in the day. You know what I mean? Um, it makes me feel good. You know, like I said, I'm 53 now, so I'm able to kind of like let it in more, and I think I need to work on that more. You know. You know, I try to, you know, I try to um, listen more when people say nice things about me. You know, it's hard. It's like love. It's like, you know, it's like, it goes back to my mom. You know, she never really said she loved me, you know, even though I knew she did, but she purposely did that because she said, I was, she goes, I was programming you to be a comedian. If I said I loved you, you would never be a comedian. And it worked. You know, because we want our love from our parents more than anything. And where did I get that love from my mom? Once I hit that stage and I became known and then she accepted me in. And that's when my relationship with her really, you know, took off. Is You know, when I was on MTV and doing my movie, she couldn't believe it. I was becoming more famous than her other comics. And it was, she was very proud of me. And, awesome. uh, and maybe she planned it. I think she did, you know, so I'm not mad that she never said that it was her plan to not say it. So, so I can, you know, work for her and make, you know, I mean, I turned out okay. You know, d d yeah. despite, you know, despite, you know, you know, the, uh, the, the upbringing and, and, you know, and, and that, you know, and, and, um, you know, and I think, I think with this whole pandemic, and this whole Donald Trump debacle and, and everything, I, I, I truly think, you know, the world is going to bounce back bigger and better than ever. Um, and I also think my heart goes out to everyone in L.A. That's my home. And um, in L.A., we'll, we'll punch back, I think, bigger and better. And the Comedy Store will be back bigger than ever. And I think, I think that this was a nice... Um, kind of a, a kind of a readjustment for everyone and just you know we imagine the day when they tell us we could sit in fucking starbucks again we're gonna be like holy shit i can like work on my computer and fucking starbucks it's like <laughs> you know it's pretty cool so all right, guys. Yeah. But, well, thank yeah, Paul, you, I, you know what? I, I just want to say one we're done we're done but i just want to say one Paul, like how you kind of looked up to guys like richard pryor and for my generation, mm. you were my Richard Pryor. I didn't relate to Richard Pryor. For, you know, mm. Richard Pryor was part of your growing up, but you were a big part of my. You were my Richard Pryor. You were my, you Adamson. That's what you were to me. So I just want to say personally, really appreciate that.